Hi, I'm Mark, and in this video, we're going to do an IELTS listening practice test. Unlike other listening practice tests that you'll find on the internet, after you've attempted the questions in this listening test, I'm going to go through the answers with you so that you'll have a better idea of what to do on test day. And this is the important part. Once you've gone through the test and gotten all the answers right or wrong, now you're ready to learn. You're going to see why you got the right ones right and why you got the wrong ones wrong. And that's where the learning happens. All right, let's kick off the practice test. For each question, you'll get a little bit of time to prepare, and then the audio will play. I'll return at the very end of the video after you finish the test, where I'll explain the answers to you. Just like the real IELTS exam, you're on your own now. Good luck. Good afternoon, Avon Meetings. How can I help? Oh, hello. My name's Cam, and I'm calling about hiring a meeting room. Certainly. Let's just check that your date is available before we go any further. When did you want to hire the room? Uh, for July. Oh, sorry, uh, June the 16th. Right. We've got plenty available then. Excellent. Now, we're a local business, and we're planning to just walk from our office to your venue on the day. So, can I just confirm the location with you? Yes, of course. We are level 50. Yes. In the Macquarie building. Oh, isn't that on Green Road by the lake? That's quite a distance from us. No, no, that's the old Macquarie building. Now we are in the city centre. It's level 16B, Jemro Road, Portsville. Oh, would you mind spelling that for me? Certainly. It's G-E-M-B-O-R-O-U-G-H Road. Okay, thank Thanks. Sorry, I'm new to the area. No problem. It's easy to find us. We're just beside the cinema, about two blocks from the State Library. Got it. Okay, I know the spot. That's perfect. It's an easy walk from our office. Great. So let me run through a couple of options and we'll work out the best one for your needs. Perfect. So I presume you need space for more than 10 people, right? Yes, probably around 30. Okay, well, there are two rooms that would probably suit you. One is the governor room, our most popular option, actually. Okay, and how many can it hold? Well, we just had a meeting yesterday with 15 people, but it usually has around 25. We just can't have more than 35 people in there. Well, that sounds fine. Does it have all the usual things? Wi-Fi, projector? Yes, and it's also equipped with its own coffee machine, which is probably why it's so popular. Hmm, and the price? That one is $445 for the day. Okay, and you said there was another one? There's also a state room, another good option for you, but the maximum capacity is 30, so we might need to check your final numbers before locking that one in. Ah, uh, yes. This one has its own restroom attached, as well as a kitchen, which is quite handy and saves time during breaks. Hmm, that's a good point. Oh, and an interactive whiteboard too, if you need that. Right, and is it more expensive than the first room? The state room is $415, Quite a good deal, actually. Mm, it is. Now, prior to your event, we just need a few details from you. The best way to do this is to complete your confirmation via a booking form online. I'll send you the link for that. That'd be great. And then just the day before, our manager will give you a ring to sort out keys. We usually leave them in our lockbox so that you can come and go as you please during the day, and you just return them at the end. Okay, then. Now, what else? Once your meeting is over, we do ask that you ensure the table has been wiped down thoroughly. Oh, of course. Our cleaners will take care of the bathroom and kitchen, but any rubbish left behind also needs to be taken out. There's a bin around the back that we'll show you on the day. All right, that'll be fine. Any laptop or TV cables you use can also just be brought back to the reception on the ground floor. 
Okay, got it. So let me run this by my manager and then I'll give you a call and... Actually, I'm going to be away from tomorrow, but I'll give you my colleague's number. She'll be able to answer any questions you have. Her name is Jenny Arja, that's A-R-J-A-H, and her number is 023-1922. Thank you so much for all your information. You've been a big help. Hey, I'm back, and you've just finished part one of four of this IELTS listening practice test. Before we move on to part two, I want to tell you about E2's online IELTS preparation platform. It's a website built specifically for IELTS students who need to reach a certain IELTS score for university, immigration, or work visas. It has everything an IELTS student could ever need and I can't recommend it enough. And signing up is super easy. Just go to e2testprep.com and click the Start Free Trial button. Let's move on to part two. But seriously, do sign up to E2 Test Prep. It has even more practice questions, just like those in this video, but better. The slide we're looking at now shows Foster Park as it looks today, with the changes that have been made. You'll notice too that a lot of the original facilities are still here, of course. Now, we've kept all four gates, but we've moved the information board. It used to be next to the tennis courts, but you'll find it now immediately to your left when you enter at the south gate. Just like before, it has details about the park opening hours, local wildlife, and a little bit about the history of the area. A brand new addition is the children's playground. If you enter by the west gate, keep walking past the path to your left, and it's just after the one to your right. Dogs are not permitted in that section, so children can play without any worries. For you dog owners, never fear, we have allocated an off-leash dog zone. This is in a fenced-off area to the southwest of the football field, basically in the centre of the park. You'll also find plastic bags there to clean up after your pet. The tennis courts are in the same spot as always, but you'll notice that we've moved the fitness area. This used to be just inside the south gate, but you'll now find it between the pond and the west gate. We think this is a much nicer spot to work out. The second last thing I'd like to point out is the new fountain, a spectacular addition, I'm sure you'll agree. From the west gate, walk along until you reach the first path and turn left there to reach it. And finally, you'll need to know where the drinking taps are, in case you're thirsty or you want to fill up your drink bottles. We decided to put these at the entrance of the south gate, on the right-hand side as you enter. So, if you are planning on playing tennis or football, you might need to hydrate or fill up your bottles beforehand. Or you can get a drink on your way out. Any questions? Now, before you go, I just want to fill you in on some of the amazing history of Foster Park. It's actually one of Brixton's most popular green open spaces. Historically, the park was used for a wide range of purposes. Just over a hundred years ago, farmers used to graze their cattle and sheep on it. It's hard to believe that there used to be animals like that roaming in the middle of the city. The only animal you see on it nowadays are dogs. Oh, and interestingly, just after World War II, the park was used to house newly arrived immigrants and returning soldiers. It was lined with tents and makeshift houses. Nowadays, it's mainly used for sporting events, including cricket and football. And there's the occasional music festival as well. In fact, there's one on this weekend. 
The park is also home to a number of buildings and structures, including a community centre and a tennis club. The community centre was the old caretaker's cottage. Quite a lot of work went into renovating that building, but it's great that they've retained almost all of the original building. Now, the tennis club is built on the site of what was an old school. Unfortunately, the school had to be knocked down. It was just too old to do up and it was unsafe. The tennis club, thankfully, is brand new and looks amazing. The other building that was torn down, which was a relief as far as I'm concerned, was an old electricity substation. It was a terrible looking old building. The council have plans to build a shelter shed there one day, but not in the near future. Okay, that was part two. Well done. Let's get straight into part three. Hi Jamie, thanks for coming in today. And let me start by saying well done on a really great presentation. Oh, thank you. I was actually very impressed with the class overall and I could see you'd put in a lot of work. I sure did, but I must say it was surprisingly enjoyable. That's good. Now, your topic was genetically modified food and the controversy surrounding it on both sides of the political divide. That's right. So how did you come to settle on this topic? Was it because of all the articles about GM food in the papers recently? I actually felt like the issue has dropped out of the public consciousness lately. I haven't seen an article on it in the mainstream media for a long time. I do remember that my dad used to get so furious reading all about the plans to expand GM crops and imports. I see. When I saw that movie by The Naturalist, ah, I forget his name, The Soil Expert. I guess that's when I really got interested, and my presentation just flowed from there. Yes, I know the one. It won several awards. So did you know much about GM food prior to your research? I thought I was an expert, but what I realised through my reading for this presentation was that I'd had a really biased attitude. I mean, I was only really aware of one half of the argument. I never read anything by people who were in favour of GM technology. It's obvious now, but I don't think I really understood the different views on the matter. Yes, that can happen, particularly these days with the way our social media is curated. How do you mean? Well, everyone's social media is increasingly personalised. The news stories that appear on your Facebook feed, for instance, tend to reflect the political or social views you hold. Yeah, I guess you're right. What do we do about that, though? I mean, we can't just disregard everything we see, right? How do we know which stories to trust? Only mainstream media? It's more a matter of consciousness, I would say. As long as you understand the way modern marketing and media work and their strategies, you can make informed choices about what you read and how far you trust it. Do remember that mainstream media also has its biases. Of course, that's true. Now, back to your presentation. I made notes, which I'll send through with your final grade, but I'm interested to know how you feel about it. Were there any areas that you were disappointed in? I know you'd been anxious about the technology side of things. I was. Last time I did a presentation for my history subject, it was a disaster. How so? I think I was just way too ambitious with the tech on that occasion. I had moving graphics and audio and video, and in the end, it just distracted from what I really wanted to say. That certainly wasn't the case this time, though. No. I think that's what I'm unhappy about. I was so put off by the previous experience that I went for just bare bones this time. It was very rudimentary, really. I wish I'd aimed a bit higher. Well, that's something to keep in mind for next time. Yeah, a good lesson, I guess. So you've just done part three of this IELTS listening practice test. Remember, if you're having trouble with any of these questions, you can learn E2 strategies at e2testprep.com. Click the link in the description below to get started. 
let's move on now to the final part of this test, part four. Thanks to all of you for coming along today to learn more about termites. I'm excited to introduce you to these most fascinating insects that are not dissimilar to ants, except they're usually white and, of course, they can destroy your house because they have an insatiable appetite for wood. Love them or loathe them, termites are certainly one of the most successful insects in the world, colonizing everywhere on Earth except Antarctica. I want to start this lecture by discussing where they live, their mounds and nests, because this is truly fascinating. The structure of a mound can be very complicated. Inside the mound it is an extensive system of tunnels and conduits that serve as a type of ventilation system for the nest. In order to get good ventilation, there's a central shaft that runs right through the middle of the mound where air is pushed down towards the nest. If we take a closer look at the central nest structure, we can see three main parts, each an engineering marvel unto itself. Right at the top of the nest is stored wood tiny bits and pieces of termites daily foraging. And right in the middle of the nest is a larger oval shaped cavity called the royal cell. Like ants, termites also have an amazing social hierarchy or social caste, including workers, soldiers, and of course, a king and a queen. So below that larger cavity are several smaller cigar shapes. These are the gallery chambers. The shape and size of these depend on the type of termite, but these ones here are pretty uniformly cigar shaped. I could talk to you all day long about the sophistication of the nest, but let's take our focus off the nest now and notice some other features of the ventilation channels. You might notice an interesting curvy or wavy outer structure. Well, these are the ridges and they help to regulate the temperature in the nest. But the real regulation is done by what you might think of as air conditioning. Can you see what look like little tubes that run just beneath the outer wall around the entire mound? They're the air channels. They help with the circulatory flow of air, and interestingly, they're unidirectional. The air follows a strict course around the entire mound. So you've just completed this IELTS listening practice test, but don't go anywhere, because I'm now going to explain to you the answers to each question. Let's start with part one. How was part one for you? This is the easiest part of the test, but as you saw and heard, it can be challenging to keep track of where to look and what to listen to. Let me go through the answers with you now. For question one, we were listening for the name of a road, but there was a distractor, green road, and that's wrong. And then the correct answer was mentioned, Jembra. But how do you spell that? Well, the name was then spelled for you. For question two, we were listening for a type of building or place. The answer was cinema, not library. Library was the distractor. Did you get that? For question three, we're listening for a number because we're looking at maximum capacity. Wow, there were a lot of numbers given. Lots of distractors, but the key phrase that gives the answer is, we just can't have more than 35 people in there. That's the maximum capacity. So the answer is 35 or 35 people. Now remember that the instruction says you can write one word and or a number. So if you wrote 30 people with two words, you would actually get this answer incorrect you need to be very careful. In this case, you could have written the number 35, which is easiest, or the number 35 with the word people. For question four, we're listening for a facility, and kitchen is the answer, but you must have spelled it correctly. Then, for question five, we need a price, a number, and 415 is mentioned, 415. How are you tracking so far? You might want to go back and read the transcript if you got any of them wrong. By now, you've had a taste of 
distractors. And they're the reason why many people fail to get the scores they need in IELTS listening. If you haven't seen it yet, make sure you watch this video on the four types of listening distractors. It explains everything you need to know about how these tests are written so that you can avoid making these mistakes. You can watch this video at e2testprep.com. All right, question six. You need to speak to the manager to arrange what? Keys, not key, keys with an S. If you missed the plural, that S, you would get it wrong. Question seven, eight, and nine. Well, the table must be cleared. No distractors there. But wiped down and cleaned are the synonyms used. The rubbish needs to be taken out or removed. That's number eight, not bin, not bin. And the answer to number nine is reception, not ground floor. All right, let's look at the final question for part one. Again, it requires listening to spelling. The answer for question 10 is arja, A-R-J-A-H. And here are the 10 answers for part one. Pause the video and compare them to your answers. Let's have a look at the answers to part two. These were the questions where you had to label a map. All right, question 11, the information board. Well, it's immediately to your left when you enter at the south gate. So the answer is F. And there's a distractor there. It used to be next to the tennis courts, but not anymore. Question 12, the children's playground. Well, you need to keep walking past the path to your left. It's just after the one on your right. So it's position B. What about the dog zone? Well, this time we need to use the compass directions. It's southwest of the football field or the bottom left. Keep that compass in mind. The answer here is C, not D. The answer to question 14, the fitness area is E. For question 15, the fountain is in position A. This one is pretty straightforward. And for question 16, the answer is G. The drinking taps are right at the entrance at the south gate on the right-hand side as you enter. So here are the answers for questions 11 to 16. How did you go with questions 17 to 20? Multiple choice and listening can be challenging because you have to read and listen at the same time. Or should I say read and then listen? flashing back and forth between the text and the audio. The answer for questions 17 and 18 are B and C, or C and B. It doesn't matter which order you put them in. The two historical uses of the park were for accommodation, mentioned when the speaker said, just after World War II, the park was used to house newly arrived immigrants. And the second answer is C, farming, because the speaker said farmers used to graze their cattle and sheep on it. For questions 19 and 20, the answers are C and D. The school and the electrical substation were both demolished, knocked down, or torn down. There are some great synonyms for demolish there. Pause the video and read the transcript to see why the answers are C and D. Now I've mentioned synonyms a few times. There's a great video over at e2testprep.com that covers the use of synonyms in both IELTS listening and IELTS reading. It's a really good video if you want to understand the way these questions are written so you can get them all right. Check it out at e2testprep.com. So the answers for 17 and 18 are B or C and C or B. Again, it doesn't matter which order you put them in. 
And then the answers for 19 and 20 are C and D in any order. So that was part two of four for this IELTS listening test. Remember, you can learn E2's methods to map labeling and multiple choice questions if you sign up for free at e2testprep.com. All right, part three now. The answer for question 21 is A. She saw a film about it. There were two major distractors where the other answer options were mentioned, but then she finally said, when I saw that movie by the naturalist, uh, I forget his name, the soil expert, I guess that's when I really got interested. Question 22 is C. This whole part is a rewording or paraphrase of she knew only one side of the argument. 23 is B. This was complicated, but it's pretty clear if you listen again or read the transcript that the professor advises Jamie to be aware of the techniques marketers use. Again, pause the video and take a closer look. And 24 is B. She should have been more ambitious. There were also some distractors in there as well. One of the difficult things about part three, and especially multiple choice, is knowing which question you're up to. You need to listen carefully for the same word or similar words used in the question prompt and the audio so you know where you're up to. This is explained in our live classes and other videos like this that you will find on E2 Test Prep. The answers for questions 21 to 24 are A, C, B, and B. And now let's look at the answers to the most challenging part of the test, part four. All right, question 25. What is the middle section of the diagram? Well, that's the central shaft. It's not a tunnel or a conduit, a ventilation system, or a nest. Question 26 is stored wood, not just wood, and definitely not daily foraging. And 27 is royal cell, C-E-L-L, -L, not S-E-L-L, -L, and not cavity. Question 28 is gallery chambers, not gallery chamber, singular, and not cigar or cigar shapes. Question 29 is ridges, R-I-D-G-E-S with an S on the end, not ventilation channels. And question 30 is air channels, not air channel, singular, or air conditioning or little tubes or circulatory flow. Well done. You've just finished an IELTS listening practice test with us here at E2. Isn't it so much easier when you have a teacher with you to go through the answers afterwards and show you where the mistakes were? Hopefully you found that helpful. Remember to click like and subscribe to this channel for more great videos. And now let's check your results. So how did you go? What's your score out of 30? And what's your estimated IELTS listening band score? Let me know in the comments below. And while you're there, share this video with your friends on Facebook or WhatsApp groups. I'm sure they'll find it useful too. Cool, so that's it. Remember, for more help, including writing feedback and speaking mock tests, as well as high quality practice questions, sign up for free at e2testprep.com or click the link in the description below. My name is Mark and I'll see you soon.